Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Medical Cannabis, Therapeutic Potential and Risks, presented by Dr. Marcel Von Miller, Research Director, the Lambert Center for the Study of Medicinal Cannabis and Hemp, Adjunct Assistant Professor of Psychology, Department of Psychiatry, University of Pennsylvania School of Med. My name is Alexis Corrales, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Simply click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop down box. Our speaker will respond to your questions via email following the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Von Miller. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thanks so much for having me. Um, today, I'm going to speak about medical cannabis, therapeutic potentials and risk. So first, um, just want to provide some disclosures prior to getting started. So I am, in addition to the um, overview that was given before, I'm also an employee of Canopy Growth Corporation former employee of Zenerba Pharmaceuticals and a former consultant for Tilray. Um, and I also serve on the scientific advisory boards of the Lambert Center and the Realm of Caring Foundation. So as we get started, you know, the really, really the big question is what is cannabis? Um, cannabis has talked about kind of this, you know, large umbrella term, but really what we know is that cannabis is, um, captures a lot of different things. Um, and we really need to think about these individual components of the cannabis plant. Um, of which there are many. So the cannabis plant we know has about 120 plus cannabinoids within the plant. THC is the most common. Um, and the majority of research really has focused specifically on THC and highlighted euphoric effects among others. THC is really considered the primary psychoactive component of the cannabis plant. But there's a lot more to cannabis than just THC. Second most cannabinoid, second most studied cannabinoid is CBD or cannabidiol. And the research in this area has really been developing um, over the past five to 10 years or so, but we really still have so much more to understand. And that's just two of the 120 plus cannabinoids in the plant. There are others, and here are just a few, THCV, CBG, CBC, and it, the list goes on and on. And the research on those individual cannabinoids or combinations of these cannabinoids is really in its infancy at this point, um, with only a handful of studies really going further down this list. Beyond the complexity of the plant, there's also complexity of formulations. So, you know, as you see in this slide, you know, when you think of cannabis, you're thinking, you know, probably traditionally on, on the top two, right, the plant or the flower from the plant. Um, but there are so many other things. And, you know, here's two examples of, you know, edibles and extracts. Um, so many different ways you can formulate the, these cannabinoids, um, extract them from the plant, you know, put them in all sorts of different products. And those themselves have lots of different um, effects just as a function of the formulation. So it's really, again, complex. We're not talking about a single molecule and a single delivery route like oral. We're talking about a complex plant with all of these moving pieces, as well as many different ways to approach delivering those um, to individuals therapeutically. To add to the complexity is the cannabis um, legal landscape. Um, so here is a, a map of where we currently are. These are states um, where cannabis um, medical cannabis is legal. Those in green are those that have um, recreational and medical cannabis laws. Those in blue are those that have straight medical cannabis laws. But beyond these, there are also lots of other states um, that have you know, more specific or nuanced laws. They may not have legalized medical cannabis broadly, um, but they may have put allowances in, for example, for CBD oil um, for seizures in children. 
And so when you fill those states in, in addition to these states listed here, there's really only one or two states that have no cannabis laws whatsoever on the books. Um, the important thing and the kind of complexity here, right, is that each of these states creates their own laws. This is a federally illegal um, substance. And so each state is kind of taking the bull by the horns and creating their own legislation around it. Um, but because of that, there is lots of variability between and between states. So this is a cartoon that I always like to put up and I've had in my slides for a while. Early on, it used to be um, kind of a joke, but now it really is the standard practice, right? Your condition is serious, Mr. Reynolds, but fortunately I scored some excellent weed that should alleviate your symptoms. Um, this is where we're at, right? And the problem is, is that interaction um, is one that, you know, is occurring more and more, but with very little evidence to support it. And that's really where we need to build up um, the research side. So here's a, an example of what, what I'm talking about. So each state creates its own laws, as I talked about before, and has a list of conditions um, typically for which medical cannabis can be used. The problem is that there's actually very little research and most of the addition of those conditions um, is done so by lobbying um, rather than based on the research. So on the left are what we have a decent amount of knowledge about, um, for which there's been literature that's built up over time. We have you know, what is considered the gold standard um, in scientific research, you know, these randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. Um, so we know, you know a decent amount about THC and nausea and vomiting, THC and pain, a combination of one-to-one -one THC and CBD for multiple sclerosis as well as CBD for pediatric epilepsy. Those, we have a decent sense that these are, you know, therapeutic um, formulations that have been shown to work for these indications. On the other hand, on the right-hand side um, are where the gaps are. And, you know, these are, they vary in terms of how big of a gap we're talking about. So anxiety, for example, um, there's actually very, you know, while lots of people use cannabis or different cannabinoids for anxiety, there's actually very little literature, um, just a few handful of um, clinical trials, pretty small scale at this point, um, that have looked at cannabinoids and anxiety, and most of them point to CBD as, a, as potentially helpful. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, this, you know, um, I'm just finishing up. We just completed the first um, phase two clinical trial on this. So again, you know, before this study that we just finished within the past couple of weeks, you know, all we have from human evidence has been, you know, a couple of, you know, studies that have been about 10 participants each. Depression, um, also maybe CBD might be a, a helpful there, but most of that is actually based on preclinical work. So we're talking rats and mice. Um, psychosis, there's building. There's a lot of attention and interest in psychosis. CBD may seem to be there, appears to be therapeutic in this space, but again, lots of clinical trials to go to meet any sort of level of evidence of those conditions on the left. And then if you keep going down the list from ALS to Alzheimer's, cancer, cerebral palsy, you know, we're really just scratching, scratching the surface. And this is really important because, you know, we need to do these large-scale studies so that we understand formulations, concentrations of cannabinoids, dosing, and all of these different pieces of it so that a doctor, like in the previous slide, you know, who sees a patient can say, oh, you have X condition, you know, I know that, you know, a combination of this and this is useful and you should start at this number of milligrams and move up and you should be concerned about drug-drug interactions for this and this. And again, we're not there for those conditions on the right. Um, and that's, you know, that's a problem. Um, and, you know, right now, everybody's going to kind of figure it out on their own. And, you know, an important part of this is that the placebo effect um, is quite high. There's a lot of expectation that cannabinoids work for these different conditions. And so, you know, you need to do these trials to really understand whether they actually do, um, because a lot of people, you know, just from the hype, just from that sort of expectation, you know, can feel better, even though it might not be actually the cannabinoid farm formulation that's doing it. So now I'm going to get into a little bit of what we do know. Um, and these break down into different types of research. So there are reviews, product regulatory research, case studies, observational studies, experimental studies, and clinical trials, the sort of gold standard. And they all are kind of pivotal in playing a part into you know, building a base for our understanding here. So an example of a review, this is one that was done um, and published a couple of years ago now um, from the National Academies of Science um, called The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids. And this sort of is a synthesis. Um, this is available online. I believe it's free. Um, it's a synthesis. All the experts got together, looked at all the literature on cannabis and, you know, came down with 
you know, this is what we know for these different conditions. Um, you know, this is the effect of THC, this is the effect of CBD or whatever it is, um, and, and kind of highlighted the gaps um, that remain. Now, of course, you know, this field is now growing so quickly that, you know, this is already outdated. You know, from this, from this publication, um, the researchers determined that there was not enough evidence or, you know, conclusive evidence to determine the effects of cannabis um, on epilepsy, but then just a short time now, we have a, a drug approved Epidiolex specifically for um, certain types of epi epilepsy, Dravet and Lennox Gastaut. And so that evidence is there. Um, so these, these reviews need to happen often um, and update, especially with um, all the stuff that's going on. Here's another one that I was involved in that can be more specific. So there are some reviews that are just very specific on certain endpoints or conditions. This one's about PTSD. There have been some others since. You know, here's the literature talking about PTSD and the different components of PTSD. This is what we know about depressed mood. This is what we know about sleep. Um, this is what we know about fear extinction, et cetera. And so these review papers you know, that are endpoint or therapeutic condition specific um, can also be helpful, but again, need to happen quite often as this is a burgeoning area of research. Then kind of the next piece is product studies. Um, and these are sort of regulatory studies really kind of getting a sense of what's going on out in the market. So remember, cannabinoids um, traditionally are not um, regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. So some people may be shocked by that, but um, with the exception, with a couple exceptions of drugs that have been approved by the FDA, Epidiolex, Syndros, and Dronabinol, um, any other cannabinoids that are out there, sold in dispensaries, you know, bought online, um, they, there is zero FDA oversight currently. Um, and as such, you know, you, you know a lot more about the Hershey bar or the pack of Doritos that you buy in the convenience store than you do about the cannabis that's being um, purchased online for therapeutic use or otherwise. Um, here's an example of a study we did looking at the accuracy of labeling, right? So really producers can put pretty much anything they want on the label and there are no standards um, that are enforced in any way. Um, and here we found that 70% of CBD extracts that are sold online um, were actually outside of the range of um, uh, of what they labeled. Um, and so in this case, you know, we gave plus or minus 10% as a margin of error. So if you were within 10% of the CBD content that was on the label, you know, we considered you accurate. And again, 70% of those fell outside of that. So this is a real problem. You know, there are some oils that people are buying that have a lot more CBD in it, which is a little bit less of concern. But there are also lots of oils and, and, and expensive ones at that that have considerably less or even no CBD in it. Um, and then there are lots of oils we found, you know, about 20% or so have THC and some, in some cases, decent amounts of THC in them um, without labeling it, right? So this is, again, a problem where you have, um, you know, individuals that may be unknowingly dosing or, or using CBD, um, using THC in these CBD extracts. Um, and, you know, people can have very different reactions or adverse, adverse reactions um, to that. And that's why it's really important to have that labeled. Others, so now as we kind of move past the sort of review and, and regulatory side, then we start thinking about clinical development. And really the first stage of that are case studies. So this is kind of where all research starts. This is um, a couple examples here on the screen um, of you know, individual observations or series of observations about um, what's going on at an individual level. So you could have a, an individual that has um, you know, had a bad experience or an individual that tried CBD and had an excellent response in a, in a condition that hasn't really been documented before. There's a, a series coming out that I was involved in looking at three patients that tried CBD for Fragile X syndrome and showed, you know, improvements in Fragile X um, symptomatology following use of different CBD products. Um, and that's sort of the first step. You want to say like, hey, look, there's this thing out there, you know, people should be looking at this, kind of an initial flare, if you will, to the field. Um, and so these case studies are really important um, for documenting that. On a larger scale, observational studies can do a similar thing. So observational studies can be um, studies that look at a population or look at a sample of folks and try and describe what's going on. Again, sort of as a flare for where we need to go in the clinical trial or kind of more methodologically rigorous approaches. Um, here's a study that we did looking at individuals um, with looking at veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder, asking them, you know, how do you use cannabis? The majority here smoke or inhale. What kind of strains or what kind of combinations of cannabinoids do you use? You know, the majority used high THC, 
Um, very few people used high CBD. And to me, a little bit surprising is that a bunch of people just said anything. Um, they'll pretty much use anything um, available. So again, you know, this is sort of, a, you know, from these data, you know, maybe THC is something worth investigating for PTSD as an example. And this is, again, not the only approach, but this is one approach to kind of get a signal of where to go in these more rigorous trials. Um, other ways of looking at epi epidemiological um, or observational data is from an ep epidemiological standpoint. So this is a study where we, you know, within the Department of Veterans Affairs, they track substance use disorders, um, cannabis, cocaine, opioids, amphetamines, and, you know, look over time at the prevalence of those. Um, and in this study, we found that among individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, not only was cocaine the number one um, abused substance up through to about 2008, um, those the FY means fiscal year. Um, but after that, you see cannabis, right? And this is again, problematic cannabis use, which is the only thing that the Department of Veterans Affairs tracks at the moment, increasing, you know, exponentially. Um, and of course, that's on track with, you know, legalization in different states. So again, this doesn't mean everything. This is just one, you know, data point, but another way to look at these observational data. So you're not going out dosing individuals or anything out. You're just kind of taking a landscape view of what's going on out in the world. And then you can also do group comparison studies. So here's a, um, another observational study where, again, you're not dosing anybody, but you're looking at individuals with autism, some of whom use cannabinoid therapy and some of who, whom don't, um, and really looking at, you know, what is the difference between users and non-users? And in this case, it appeared that individuals who use cannabinoids, um, individuals with autism who use cannabinoids, had um, improved quality of life, um, improved sleep, anxiety, and depression. And that was, sorry, just as a step back, this was cross-sectional, these data. So just kind of looking at one point in time, but you can also do this prospectively. So this is a study that we're actually just finishing up um, a prospective observational study on cannabis and PTSD. This is some initial results. These are not the final ones, but um, you know, looking at what is the impact of cannabis use among individuals with PTSD. So half the individuals um, using cannabis at the start of the study, half the individuals not, and tracking their PTSD symptoms over time. The caps total severity in the middle is that overall PTSD symptoms. And as you see, the blue kind of bluish gray line being cannabis users, and the orange line being non-users, you see that those cannabis users appear to actually be doing better, even though they started at the same point. Um, after you look at them over the course of 12 months, they appear to be doing better than the non-users. And then you can break that down by symptom cluster and kind of see where these differences might be lying, for example, in negative alterations in cognition and mood, as well as arousal and reactivity. So again, another way of looking at observational data um, you know, relatively speaking, easy to conduct compared to clinical trials, but where you can get a sense of what's going on um, out in the world. And that can help you, again, guide you where to look, right? If cannabis users were doing worse than individuals that were non-users, um, you might not want to look at potentially, you know, cannabinoids as therapeutic for PTSD. But in this case, you know, like, huh, maybe there's something there. Maybe this is something worth pursuing, coupled with the data on you know, that we looked at before on, you know, strain preference and these sorts of things, you can see all these sort of data points coming together of like how to approach a clinical trial and how to test this out more rigorously. So is this really all we have? Um, no, um, but really the needed studies um, are a pain to complete, right? So what we've talked about are kind of the easy, easier stuff. It's not easy by any stretch of the imagination, but once you start moving from these observational, epidemiological, product safety, and review studies into the clinical trial space, um, it gets significantly more challenging. And the reason for that is because cannabis um, in most preparations is, is, remains federally illegal. It's a DEA Schedule I um, drug. Um, and that means that any clinical trials, again, with a couple exceptions, um, and right now more recently with the Farm Bill, with the exception of hemp-derived um, CBD, um, that is, you know, less than 0.03% THC is the, is the definition of it. With the exception of that, you know, if you're studying THC, you're studying a one-to-one -one combination of THC and CBD, you're studying any sort of other variations there, even CBD that's synthetically derived, anything in that, you're Schedule 1. Um, and you remain in Schedule 1, meaning that each site has to have a Schedule 1 license from the DEA. The DEA has pretty uh, strict oversight into um, the production all the way through to dispensing of the product. 
There's specific applications that each site in the clinical trial has to do, safes that the product has to be stored in, in some cases bolted to the floor with special inspections and security. Um, and then there's also limitations on where you can get the product from. If you want botanical product, um, you have to get it from the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, um, or you could get it from some pharmaceutical companies, but it would have to be their pharmaceutical product, um, or you can synthetically manufacture it. So again, this is within the United States, this is an issue. Um, other countries have very different rules and regulations. So it's easier to conduct trials, for example, in Australia or in Canada, because they don't have the same scheduling of cannabis or THC. Um, and so, you know, with these hoops, these are not barriers, these are really hoops um, that drag the process out. You know, um, it makes it difficult and, and, and kind of aversive for some folks to engage. Um, and so a lot of researchers have kind of stayed out of it or done research in other countries. Um, so, you know, but there are some folks um, that do um, do this work within the United States. So here's sort of a poll just to kind of keep, keep it a little bit engaging. So under what schedule, so this is the DEA scheduling, um, does THC fall? So schedule one, schedule two, schedule three, all of the above or none of the above? The answer really is all of the above. And this is what's so, sort of crazy from the DEA perspective is that THC, um, if it's derived from the cannabis plant, remains in Schedule 1. Um, if THC is, um, is, is taken um, from a pharmaceutical company, it's specifically Syndros, um, so manufactured by Insys Pharmaceuticals, that is Schedule 2. Um, and Dronabinol or Marinol is Schedule 3, even though we're all talking about THC. It's the exact same molecule, exact same structure, and it's in three different schedules just as a function of where it comes from. And so this is, again, where the complexity and the confusion comes in. Um, it can really be a nightmare to do these clinical trials. Here's the, the DEA federal law scheduling here, and you see marijuana as Schedule 1, dronabinol in an oral solution. This is Syndros as Schedule 2, and then dronabinol synthetic in sesame oil, as, um, which is marinol in, in Schedule 3. CBD similarly, and it's just getting a lot more confusing here. Um, so CBD... You know, does it fall in Schedule 2, 3, 4, all of the above, or none of the above? And, and the answer is none of the above, right? So CBD um, is Schedule 1 if it's synthetically manufactured. If it comes from cannabis, um, it's Schedule 5 in the preparation of Epidiolex, um, which is, you know, suspended in sesame oil. Or if it comes from hemp, um, it's unscheduled as of the farm bill. So, again, very confusing landscape to navigate. Um, and again, we're talking the exact same molecule. CBD that's found in the plant and CBD that's synthetically manufactured in this example is exactly the same, um, but it's completely different in terms of schedule. So the bright side. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of some of the cool experimental um, and clinical work that's going on in the space for those that have um, plotted along and, and done this work, um, both within and outside the United States. So here's a study by my colleague, Ryan Bandry, who does experimental work. Um, and this is looking at um, THC administration, 25, so individuals that are given 25 milligrams of THC, either by smoke, vape, or oral administration. And what you see here is, um, so on the left side, this is their blood concentration. So when they smoke or vape THC at 25 milligrams, they get a very quick peak effect. So all the way up, you know, for vaping up to 14 nanograms per ml. Um, and then, you know, very quickly that kind of dissipates. And by hour three or so, um, their blood level is below two nanograms per ml. On the other hand, in oral administration, you see a much more delayed effect, right? And a much lower nanogram per ml peak blood. So this is kind of a cool way to do experimental research. I think Ryan Vandry is probably one of the more cutting edge in this space of looking at the, you know, administering these within a lab and looking at the impact of different routes of administration on outcomes. On the right-hand side um, are drug effects. So, you know, um, individuals that are reporting um, how high they feel. Um, and again, you see, you know, um, individuals that smoke or vape having a very quick effect, um, kind of following the blood pretty similarly, a little bit longer delay um, to returning to baseline. Um, but in oral administration, you see almost a peak, you know, a delay again, but almost a peak effect similar to smoking and vaping. But if you look back at the blood level, the blood level is way lower, right? And so here you have an individual that may not test positive, right? Almost has, you know, has very little um, blood THC, but 
has a similar subjective effect of an individual that's smoked or vaped. Um, so again, these nuances are really important to, to learn about and to, to determine, and this is really where some really fascinating work is going on um, from the experimental side. And then there are clinical trials. So as you move sort of these more traditional um, phase two, phase three clinical trials, this is one um, with Epidiolex that was published a few years back. Um, and this was a, an open label study where individuals were enrolled, um, all given Epidiolex, um, and you know took a look at what the impact was on their seizures, um, what their side effects were. So you see here somnolence, decreased appetite, diarrhea, fatigue as some side effects that were that were identified. Um, and you know on the bottom right you see seizure frequency, and so you can see this decrease in seizure frequency over time over the course of 12 weeks. Everybody knew they were getting the drug, but you kind of look at this in an open label trial. That's how it's typically done. But you look at this sort of change in seizure frequency in this case outcome over the course of 12 weeks or, or whatever makes sense within your endpoint. Here's another study. This is kind of on the flip side, looking at consequences. Um, this is a study looking at dronabinol for the treatment of cannabis dependence. So there are some individuals that have problems associated with their cannabis use. Um, and this is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at you know, individuals that take dronabinol, so that synthetic THC that we talked about before, and its impact on um, symptoms of um, withdrawal um, from cannabis dependence. So dynamite grass, right? Well, it's a little more nuanced than that. And I'm just gonna talk, touch a little bit at the end here about consequences and some future directions. So really it's not all gumdrops and lollipops. There are some consequences associated with this. Some of these are controversial a little bit, some of them are not. Um, these are you know, some of the more common ones, short-term use of, of particularly THC has been associated with impaired short-term memory, motor coordination, altered judgment, some paranoia and psychosis, again, from short-term use. And long-term use has been pretty established that um, this causes addiction or dependence. Um, for adolescents, brain development um, can be altered. Um, so really try to avoid um, high doses um, or long-term use of THC in adolescence or, or childhood um, because there's been some downstream effects on that. Um, then, you know, some of these others, you can, you know, there's been some pushback a little, poor educational outcome, cognitive impairment, diminished life satisfaction and achievement, um, symptoms of chronic bronchitis. Um, and, you know, this last one is kind of, you know, I, I, I kind of focus on the first two and the last one is really the strongest evidence, you know, the last one being individuals that have a risk for schizophrenia and psychosis, so you know, a genetic risk factor, family history, et cetera, um, are at increased risk if they're using um, THC of, of developing such disorders. So just really important things to think about. You know, it is, you know, while use can have its benefits, you know, particularly use of THC, repeated use, frequent use for a long period of time can lead to consequences. It can lead to difficulties quitting. It can lead to altered brain development if it started too early, and it can lead to risk of chronic risk of psychosis um, or schizophrenia among those with vulnerabilities. So here's a, an example um, of this, sort of the consequences side uh, from an observational standpoint. This was a study in a medical ma cannabis dispensary um, among adults. Um, where individuals self-reported on symptomatology. Briefly, this was about 217 people, majority white. Uh, this was conducted in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and this is just some background again on education, um, marital status, et cetera. And the top 10 reasons why individuals reported using medical cannabis was anxiety, chronic pain, all the way down through post-traumatic stress disorder. What you can notice here is that the percentages overlap Right, so um, there, these are individuals that are using for multiple reasons. Right, There's, this doesn't just add up to 100%. Um, you have people that are using for anxiety and chronic pain and depression or whatever. Um, also, and typically, you know, there have been lots of studies since this one, um, but most of them find anxiety and chronic pain. One or the other, they kind of flip flop for the number one condition why individuals use uh, medical cannabis. And then we looked at abuse and dependence. So let's look at negative consequences um, as a function of each of these different conditions. Um, and we see, you know, a decent number of folks, um, you know, folks that are using for anxiety, folks that are using for PTSD and all the way through, 
um, our meeting criteria. We did a diagnostic assessment. These, these are individuals that are meeting criteria for substance abuse, meeting criteria for cannabis dependence. Um, you know, so this is, you know, an important consideration. A lot of people say, oh, this is not a big deal. Well, you know, it is. Um, and, you know, while a lot of people might not be dependent on the drug, there are few that do. Um, and a lot of people don't even know that they can have problems with dependence or, you know, have difficulty quitting because they've never tried. Um, you know, this, you know, characteristic of dependence is, you know, to increase tolerance, needing to use more and more to get the same effect, craving during times that you're not using, um, you know, when you stop having withdrawal symptoms, and these withdrawal symptoms last quite some time. So again, um, important to think about within this, um, are these negative consequences and to track them. Um, another study here, this is a study looking at individuals um, with PTSD, with in, all, all the individuals with cannabis use disorder or, you know, dependent cannabis use, um, some with PTSD, some without. And again, we find, you know, individuals with PTSD may be at higher risk. Um, these are individuals that are more likely to use for coping reasons, more likely to have withdrawal during discontinuation, more likely to crave during times um, that they're not using. And so these are the sorts of things that are important to track, not just in the general population, as we saw before, but also some certain specialized populations may be particularly at risk. If one were to go down the path on these negative consequences of quitting or attempting treatment, um, it's pretty difficult. You know, our treatments um, for cannabis use problems or, or heavy cannabis use um, are not that great. Relapse is very common, um, you know, among about 63% of people receiving motivational enhancement um, or motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy. So these are two treatments, which we'll talk about in a second, relapse within four months, 72% by six months. Among in another study among cannabis dependent outpatients, you know, we see up to 71% um, lapsing within six months. So that's using again. So again, these are people that are, you know, a subset of the population that really want to stop using, have difficulties using, and they're not that successful. This is um, some of our best treatments, red cognitive behavioral therapy, green contingency management, and yellow cognitive behavioral therapy plus contingency management. So these are sort of a, your traditional behavioral um, approach to treatment as well as um, contingency management, which is the sort of like providing incentives um, for sustained periods of abstinence. Um, and you see in the study, you know, just out of the door, ETX being end of treatment, rates are not that great. And if you look out six months, nine months, 12 months, you know, these precipitously drop um, regardless of treatment, though the combination appears to be a little bit better. But these are not great numbers um, and shows kind of where from a treatment perspective, we have difficulties. If you look at predictors of relapse, so why is it that individuals are stopping or having difficulty stopping? Um, low levels of physical activity, poor sleep, um, and positive expectancies. You know, if you think this is great um, and it's really helpful for you, um, of course, you're going to have difficulty when you stop. Um, so there's, you know, there's a whole line of research that looks at this this piece. You know, how can we predict individuals that are going to have problems with use? Um, how are we going to help them quit? And how are we going to identify those folks that are most vulnerable to relapsing during quit attempts? Here's a study that we did is looking exactly at that. So orange line is PTSD diagnosis. Um, white line is no PTSD diagnosis. These were all folks that had a cannabis use disorder. And we're really looking here to see, all right, individuals that are interested in quitting, um, they stop using, and we follow them over time to see how likely they are to relapse or use cannabis at all. And this is just looking at using cannabis at all, and we find that the individuals with PTSD, for the first four weeks or so, which kind of maps on to the time period of which um, cannabis withdrawal is most salient, um, they have, you know, they're using more cannabis than the non-users, though they appear to catch up over time. So let's look at the clinical landscape and um, implications. You know, as we start stepping back, so that's the kind of negative consequences. Where does this all kind of connect together? Um, is patient care, right? We really need to understand this from a patient care perspective. Um, and here is one study where we looked at physicians, right? So what do physicians think of all this? And this was really asking physicians about um, what they think about cannabis in terms of post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety. So some of those top two of those top 10 conditions that we talked about before um, that individuals use medical cannabis for. This is the kind of breakdown of the sample. And this is probably a terrible chart. Um, but really, this is um, 
you know, something, you know, because of these gaps, because of the gaps in, um, in terms of what we know therapeutically, the fact that we still need to figure out a lot in terms of dosing and coupled with that, the negative consequences that are definitely a real risk, um, particularly among heavy users of THC, you have a lot of individuals, um, a lot of physicians on that, that space um, that don't believe um, it's safe to use cannabis um, for these conditions. Um, and, you know, and are very unlikely, if you see kind of towards the bottom, prescribing cannabis for PTSD or writing a recommendation, right? Never or not at all is the majority of these physicians because, again, the data aren't there. And while there are lots of individuals that believe, you know, and have personal experiences and, and you know, we really need to bridge this gap or else physicians are not going to do it. Right, physicians are used to traditional medication, where they need to know exactly what the formulation is. We know we know the consistency of the product over time. You know that it's safe to administer. You know how much to administer and over what period of time. And you know what drugs drug drug interactions there are to be careful of. Um, so again, you know that coupled with the negative consequences, which are real for some for any drug, right, and, and including cannabis, you know you see hesitancy from the physician side in terms of engaging. Um, in this study, we looked at, um, you know, this is kind of plays it out, right? So in the previous study, we saw that a lot of, sorry to get back, conduct, for, so the second from the top, conducting formal assessments of cannabis use or problems, you know, half of the individuals um, or the physicians really don't even assess for problems. Um, and again, this is where the knowledge base is, um, translates is to medical records. So this is a study where we looked at all individuals that, that we identified as having a cannabis use disorder in this particular group. So that's the 100% um, on the white bar on the left. Um, so we, you know, this is a group of all people that have problems with cannabis use, and we look in their medical records, and only 23% of them have that identified in their medical records at all. So again, this is that gap. If you're not assessing as a clinician for problems associated with use, um, we're not able to track, right, from a, a, a meta level what's going on and, and be able to assign treatments or no treatment uh, need across a healthcare system. And so ways of doing that and um, ways of intervening are, are, you know, very simple. You know, you don't have to do full on, full blown assessments. There are little things that can help you get an idea. This is a, a great instrument developed, um, what, nine years ago now uh, by Simon Adamson. Eight questions called the Cannabis Use Disorder um, Identification Test Revised. Eight questions, people fill it out, and it, with pretty decent accuracy, it can identify um, individuals that have problems associated with use. We then thought, well, eight questions might be too long, right? There are lots of settings like primary care. You see the doctor for two seconds. You see an intake for two seconds. So we narrowed it down to three questions. And now, you know, in three questions, similarly, similar sort of um, ability to detect problematic use, three questions, we can get a score. We have a cutoff score here, you know, for this measure, two or higher, you know, it's much better than flipping a coin. You can, you know, with a score of two or higher from this, you can really identify people that are likely to need some intervention or have some problems with use. Um, so again, important things from a clinical standpoint and, and how these the rubber meets the road here. And then finally, from a treatment approach, you know, we talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, uh, contingency management, and but you know, learning from from a treatment perspective those problems um, that subgroups have. So we looked at that PTSD graph, and we saw that you know individuals with PTSD, at least for the first four weeks, had greater difficulty than those without PTSD. Maybe from a different study that that was because they had more craving or withdrawal. Um, then you know there are treatments that have now come up recently. This is one by Sudi Back, um, specifically targeting these subpopulations. So this is a concurrent treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder and substance use disorder. So let's you know hone in on these populations that are greatest need and, and figure out treatments for them. So instead of leaving on a negative note, um, let's talk about a positive note. So where are we going from here? This is pretty much the end of the talk. Um, just a couple quick slides on future studies that are coming up. I'm in landing soon. One um, is the study that I've been involved in as principal investigator, um, looking at cannabis concentration and PTSD symptoms. So really having 70 to 76 veterans with treatment resistant PTSD um, and assigning them, you know, administering the drug, giving them high THC and a high CBD. So kind of like a one-to-one, -one, a high THC and a low CBD, a high CBD and a low THC. So kind of the inverse and a placebo. And here giving that to, you know, giving it to them for three three weeks um, 
using ad libs so they can really kind of self titrate to what works for them. After three weeks, they stop. We have a washout period. So we can see that sort of the important thing, right? The therapeutics on the first three weeks. And then when they stop using, how do they do, right? Those are those sort of dependence and, and, and discontinuation and withdrawal problems that are, again, really important to, to, to look at. We really need a balanced approach when we think about medicine. And then after those two weeks of, of washout, then they are re-randomized to another condition, which they use for three weeks, and then again, two weeks of cessation. So um, in this study, we're looking at PTSD, suicide, um, functioning, and also, like I said, negative consequences. So again, let's take a balanced approach to this and really try to understand it. So that study just completed and we'll be publishing um, this year. Um, and another study um, from a former postdoc of mine down at VA San Diego, this is the first actual study that the Department of Veterans Affairs has funded in the cannabinoid administration um, space, which is really exciting. Um, she's looking at um, 136 military veterans with PTSD um, and really focusing on whether um, CBD, so cannabidiol, can be used as an adjunct to prolonged exposure. So prolonged exposure is kind of the primary behavioral, kind of the, the gold standard, if you will, behavioral treatment for PTSD, um, but it has its limitations. And so can we add CBD um, versus placebo, right? So in this randomized controlled trial to see whether individuals that have this sort of adjunct of CBD do better. Um, are they able to stay in treatment longer? Are they able to, you know, um, have a reduction in symptoms quicker? Um, and we look at this with primary outcomes like the CAPS-5, which is the kind of diagnostic um, standard for PTSD, as well as um, uh, other secondary outcomes like the PCL and then safety and side effects again. So this is starting, actually I should say, initiates in the spring 2019, it's been delayed. And again, this is your exact um, issue is that these studies are hard to do um, and there's lots of hoops. And so this study you know, has been in the works, you know, after receiving funding, it's taken a year to get it off the ground. And that's um, that's the difficulty in doing it. But you know, for the strong-willed um, and those with grit, you can make it through it. Um, and so that's the, you know, that's pretty much it. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bonbiller, for that informative presentation. I would also like to thank Labberts for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2019. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions that you've submitted via email. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Goodbye.